Hey folks, it's Michael with the Reason RX podcast. Me alone here today. Melanie's busy momming around and uh, teaching piano and music and everything, so she wasn't able to make it today. But uh, today we're talking to the great Tom Brown the Third. Um, some of y'all know him really well. Some of y'all don't. But the ones that don't, you need to. Um, this is uh, some stuff. Tom can help us in a lot of things that we really need to get into. Um, biology is important in education in general and in life. It's really um, not emphasized as it should be in our education, biology, ecology, things like that. Um, and doing it real, not just uh, pretending it in books. But uh, Tom lives it. Tom does it. Tom knows it. So, uh mm -hmm. He's uh, got a lot of good things to say, but uh, would you introduce yourself to the folks, Tom, background and all that? Sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, yeah, my, as Michael said, my name is Tom Brown III, and I am the son of uh, Tom Brown Jr., who some of you may have, may have heard of. He's uh, written quite a few books on the subject of tracking nature and wilderness survival. He's also the founder of the Tracker School, uh, which he started in uh, New Jersey in the late 70s. Uh, and I am essentially a continuation of him. Uh, you know, I, I, I knew from an early age, uh, um, growing up around him, uh, you know, I was able to, to capture his passion for the wild places and for the, the beings that we all share space with. And, you know, I continue that work, uh, nowadays I, currently I reside out in Oregon. I work for an organization called Trackers Earth. Uh, and we essentially help to reconnect everybody back to nature, uh, children and adults, uh, through a, uh, large amount of programming, all, all designed to foster a deeper connection to the natural world. So that's, uh, you know, essentially what I do. And I, you know, as I said, uh, my main vehicles for connecting people to the natural world are the primitive living skills that our ancestors used um as well as uh you know tracking and the art of awareness so that's uh you know pretty much how i spend my days when i'm not teaching i'm also uh, uh the land steward for a few of our properties so i i manage them uh keep them nice and happy not only for our students but for the uh the more than human world as well and yeah. uh you know i've been doing it now for for a fairly long time Cool. Going on 20 years of, uh, of teaching. And uh, so when you started out, it was basically not just like uh, tracking alone, but it was all, everything all wrapped up into one big package. Survival and tracking. Yeah. And... Sorry. Go ahead. Most, most definitely. You, 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 it's really hard to separate out any of those those subjects. You know, yes, you can... Uh, you know, look at tracking, um, you know, it should be defined as the art of, of following actual tracks animals leave uh, as a very, you know, clinical science, but there's so much more wrapped up in it. Um, you know, you can't be a good tracker without being a good naturalist. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you need to know the animals you're tracking. You need to know their environments. You need to know what they're eating. You need to know, you know, where they are at a specific time of year. And, you know, when and only when you kind of have an understanding of all of those, you know, other other facets to it, uh, can you really become a, a truly a good tracker? Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. It's like, yeah, um, a lot of kind of basically scientific thought involved. Like you can't track deer without mm -hmm. knowing what a deer is and how it behaves and the essence of a deer. Um Exactly. I mean, everyone knows it's on land, not the water, and that's like part of it, and <laughs> um, four feet and stuff like that, but yeah, it's like, um, then when you start to study it more, what does it eat, where does it go, how does it move, um, mm -hmm. why, knowing why things happen, um, but... Uh, yeah, and you definitely have to understand that the, uh, you know, the animals in the landscape are intimately connected, you know, uh, a, a, a statement that I really love... Um, is goes like this an animal is an instrument played by the landscape 
Yeah, I was going to ask you so, to say that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I heard you say that on some other podcasts. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, and, and once again, in order to, to, to really understand that animal, you need to, you know, through awareness, uh, you know, you need to uh, understand the landscape itself. To, mm-hmm. It's a hugely important part of it, you know. Yeah, interesting. Pertains to us, too. Um, contrary oh, to what some people might want to think, we're animals, too. Yes, we are. <laughs> and the landscape plays us. <laughs> yes, it does. It's like as much as some people want to think we might play it, and to some extent we interact, it's like essentially it plays us. It's the mm. leader. That's why I always, I always get the kick, you know, the kick of people talking about saving the earth. Um, you know, no matter how much damage we cause to the earth, eventually, uh, you know, when we're long gone, <laughs> the earth will heal itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, it may take a while, but the earth is going to be just fine. Uh, it's, it's, it's us, <laughs> it's us and our impact. That's, that's not so good. Hmm, yeah. It's an interesting way to look at it. We're not going to heal the earth. We've got to heal like people, <laughs> heal ourselves, heal the culture. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Reeducation. Sure. Yeah. But, um, yeah, and one thing, if you want to talk about this a little bit, it might be interesting. Um, I was listening to you talk on, uh, if I pronounce her name right, April Vokey's show. I think you like did two episodes with her and um so that was uh, nice april thank you um like some of the questions and some stuff i didn't expect i like that uh y'all went off a little bit into talking about um it might have been inadvertent but um movement barefoot stuff like that um because one thing that seems to be underplayed in tracking um people are always focused outside which is of course naturally i mean like outside themselves but okay we got the tracking the animals uh the landscape what the animals eat how they behave the weather the geology but what about how we move um i think that doesn't that doesn't seem to be much brought up or thought about in the tracking community that i'm aware of i'm new to it i don't know everything you know it better than i do but I think that's something that more people need to like dig into um, because we can't track unless we're engaged in the landscape and we can move really well. And one problem we have today in like westernized cultures is that a lot of people cannot move. They don't do what's biomechanically correct. Um, A lot of people, you go to a foreign culture, you know, like in Korea or Japan, it's great. They can squat down really low for like five hours straight. How many Americans yep. can like even squat down for, for like half a second? Never mind three hours. Nope. Or bad posture. I've heard that 50 to 70 percent of Americans don't know how to breathe right. You know they don't do diaphragmatic yep. breathing well. Um, but you gonna say something? Go ahead. Yeah, no. But I was just gonna say, you know, uh, movement um, is a is a is a huge cornerstone of what I teach. You know, in fact, cool. I just got done teaching a rather uh, lengthy um, talk about it yesterday. Uh, you know, we modern humans, our our, our, our our new society, our global society is so incredibly fast paced. You know, we're all, when we're in our, our real lives, and I'll throw some air quotes up there, you know, we're, we're busy. We have to get from point A to point B. We have to get to work, to school. And we have very little time to do it in. So we are taught from an early age to, to move quickly. And the problem with that is then, you know, people want to go back into the woods and enjoy nature. And they move that same speed. And when we do that, we become an alien invader in nature. And mm-hmm. the beings that exist out there, you know, nature as a whole moves very slowly. Um, you know, very, very slowly compared to what we do. And when we move the speed we normally move in society, in nature, uh, you know, we are creating an incredible disturbance that carries over great distances. You know, people ask me all the time, you know, how come when I go into the woods, I don't see any animals? Or, you know, how can I see (laughs) more animals when I go into the woods? You know, and the main thing I tell people, you know, I could teach you... 30 different stalking steps for stalking across anything from gravel to ice 
Uh, but the main thing is just to, to slow ourselves down. Uh, you know, that, that it, it just, it's not going to work. Eh? It's not going to work any other way. Mm-hmm. You know, and when we enter the woods and we're moving fast, I mean, I, and I've, and I've, I've witnessed this personally, just sitting in the woods quietly and having people enter that space, um, you can look and listen and feel the whole dynamic of the forest change when they sense those people coming, you know, and those, uh, you know, I'd love to be able to get inside the head of some of these animals when they, yeah, you know, John or Jane Q public comes bumbling through the woods. <laughs> like it, it's got to be just this completely foreign invasion to them. And then, you know, if you just, if you just, Take a minute to, you know, before you enter the woods to slow yourself down, take a deep breath, move half the speed you normally would. Um, you'd be amazed at how much more you'll see and how much less of a, of a, of a reaction the forest will have to you. Yeah. Um, it's really quite remarkable. And not only that, but our, you know, our, our modern hasty movement is horrible for our bodies. It's absolutely horrible for our Especially bodies. When it's it's no wonder it. that people have. Yeah, especially when it's done in a biomechanically incorrect way, the way most people unfortunately do it, don't have good movement role models. Yep. And so, um, unfortunately, like I was that way too. I had to learn. I was like horrible in my movement and everything, but um, people are going fast, but you can go fast, but they're not even doing it in a like human appropriate way. Sorry. But, yeah. Yeah. And there are, and no, and there are totally ways to, to move quickly and efficiently and, and biomechanically correct. But I, I think first that the, the first and foremost, the cornerstone of it is you learn, need to learn to cultivate that that slowness. You know, you can still have that slowness within you, even if you are moving fast. You know, it's not yeah. like our ancestors or all hunter gatherers constantly crawled around at the snail's <laughs> pace. Uh, yeah. You know, if you look at the, you know, the Tarumara of the Copper Canyon region of Mexico, here's peoples that are capable of running, you know, 50, 60, a hundred miles, you know, everybody is able to do this because they run in a, in a, in a, in a proper way. Did you, so yeah, the movement thing is, Oh, go ahead. So did you see the video? There's a guy in the U S who could run like a three and a half hour marathon and he went to Africa and he <laughs> raced a primitive tribesman in a sprint there and he recorded it it was great did you see that it's like no no I have the guy's that. running oh, and he's shit. like forcing oh. it and he's like oh tense and he's like looking like a ungainly kid learning to walk like run and the tribesmen are watching and they're just laughing and the guy he's racing is just moving effortlessly and efficiently and yep. he's laughing and he's joyous the whole time whereas the americans just Ugh! it's like it's yeah. hard work and oh i'm just like so like in pain, it was, it was like the contrast was amazing. Yeah, the, there's other stories out there about, uh, you know, the ultra marathoners going down to run races against the, the Taramara in Mexico. And the Taramara tribes people would get so far ahead of these, you know, world class ultra marathoners <laughs> that they would stop and smoke cigarettes on the side of wow. the trail as they're waiting for these these ultra marathoners to catch up to them. <laughs> Um, wow. and because the way those people's runs, you know, indigenous people run, run is, uh, you know, you're allowing the mechanics of your body and your connective tissues to do a lot of the work. You're not necessarily putting much effort into it. Whereas yeah. if you think of a Western runner, you think of like the sweaty dude just giving it his all, you know, that might be good for a quick all out sprint, but that's not going to give you. Uh, that's not going to give you uh, uh, distance or endurance over long distances. It's just uh, just just not the way to do things. Or if you're in a survivalist situation, it's um, not a good idea. It's like not good in the long run. You're going to wear yourself out, stop yourself, die. Yep, man. Conservation of energy is is paramount when you are in a survival situation. You do not want to burn any extra calories. You know, I mentioned earlier an animal being an instrument played by the landscape. Uh, the, the, the second part of that is an animal will always take the path of least resistance and less pursued. Mm-hmm. And the reason being is they don't want to expend any unnecessary energy. 
Um, that's why with a little bit of skill and training, you know, animals are pretty predictable and you can pretty easily figure out where to find them. Um, just by, you know, what I call hmm. landscape tracking, looking at, oh, the, yeah. at the landscape as a whole and, uh, finding those paths of least resistance. And it's something we naturally do as well when we, when we move through the forest, you know, things like switchbacks and, you know, you, you're never going to go <laughs> straight up a super steep hill. It's just not efficient or good for you you're gonna do some switchbacks and animals are the exact same way yeah and um like when you were on april show i like you like the fact that you brought up that a lot of people think of native american survival skills just because that's the most recent um group we have but it's these are traditions that pertain to all humans all our history we wouldn't be that way without it but so in that context yep. i like Kind of with what you were saying, I heard a phrase, um, because, so we, we all have that background, but unfortunately living in houses and stuff, some like Europeans or, Amer or Americans have kind of lost those skills and that ability to move. And so in that context, I've heard some American Indians say, um, you know, I haven't heard it myself, but I just heard that some have said this in some like reading I've done. They say that... Uh, Indians, it's something like, I forget the exact quote, but um, Native Americans move with the forest. White men move through the forest. <laughs> so it's kind yeah. of like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, I, I, another term I constantly use with my, with my classes, especially as it pertains to movement, is when we move across the landscape, we want to move with the ebb and flow of the landscape and what's going on around us. Um, nice. You know, not against it, not imposing our will, you know, upon the landscape. And it's true with survival. You know, if you, that's why a lot of these, you know, shows that are out there nowadays, you know, man versus wild and, you know, always presenting this, you know, humans and nature in an adversarial relationship. Yeah when that's not that's not how it's done at all that's a good way to you put it you need to move with the ebb and flow yeah you that's need to surrender to what's what's going on around you it's one reason i don't like the naked and afraid because it's like where like they're not developing and like developing like the land around them and you know i want to see people doing what people have done for like millennia is using things getting better having a house starting to develop working with the land and being successful and flourishing and not this like um afraid stuff and like the adversarial thing as you said uh, yeah oh uh, and i could i could tell you some stories about friends of mine who have been on that show and hmm. you know i i get offered i get offered tv opportunities okay. all the time i, I mean i i you know, starting when this whole kind of survival TV show craze started, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, I've probably at this point turned down hundreds of opportunities. <laughs> and yeah. mo mostly because, you know, <laughs> a, it, a, it's, you know, the, the humans and nature in an adversarial relationship and then B, what they're doing now is they're using, uh, you know, wilderness survival uh, as uh, and nature as another vehicle to showcase human drama because that's what they really want in those shows is yeah. they want the people arguing. Good they point. they yeah. want them breaking down and crying. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not about the skills. It's not about the nature connection. It's it's about the it's about the drama and that's why I just steer hmm. clear of any of those with a ten foot pole. And finally, in the last few years, they know better than to to email me occasionally <laughs> i'll still get you know i'll still get one with some you know crazy concept uh you know i got one recently where they you know do you know two siblings who have been estranged for a decade or more <laughs> who 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 you could link up in a wilderness survival situation to help them rekindle their relationship yes like, i do really? but i won't thank you very much <laughs> oh god yeah it's it, it's just the whole thing's absurd. And, I, and I've tried to pitch to producers, you know, hey, if you want to do a, a show that's actually educational and 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 shows nature how me and my colleagues view it, I would be all in on that. But they just, you know, hmm, sad. 
they're TV people and they're, they're after one thing and that's ratings. And, you know, what I have to offer probably wouldn't bring very many ratings, hmm, but even if I was naked, <laughs> yeah. but I think maybe their perspective is wrong. I wonder if some of them would think about pitching it to schools. If you made something about, um, nature and survival and all these other things you do, um, and did it in a proper way, seems like there could, there'd be a big market with all the, and all the schools we have elementary through high school. Um, yeah, we, I do have some friends who are, um, you know, independent media folks, um, who are starting to work on some, some projects like that, that, oh, nice, you know, we'll, we'll have some actual educational value and, uh, you know, <clears throat> showcase these things in, in a much better way than, than they have been to date so far. That's good to hear. Look forward to yeah. that coming out. But, uh, yeah, in regard, in regard to movement, let me see. Sorry, folks, if you want to hear more about that. Maybe we can talk about it more in the future. Time's limited. Everything's limited and finite. I want to talk a little bit more mm. about movement if we could. But did you say mm. on in April's podcast, was it you and that podcast, if I remember right? Like, did you say you've gone up and touched a deer before? Yep. Sweet. Yes, I have. I, I have. I have stalked up and touched um, quite a few different animals and birds in my life. It, it's wow. in kind of my, in my realm and, in, in uh, you know, the, the kind of survival school, primitive skills school realm that's, uh, you know, considered to be one of the, the ultimate things to be able to, to get that close, you know, whether it's, you can, you know, wait in one spot still long enough to have that encounter or actually, um, you know, stock up and uh, up and do it. Um, and it's, it's really quite interesting when you actually achieve it the way some animals will hmm. react, hmm. Um, you know, because they're, you know, pretty much any animal out there other than maybe an armadillo is a million times more aware than the average human. Yeah. And when a human can, you know, can violate that awareness and get to that touching distance, um, uh, animals can react in all, in all sorts of different ways. I've heard all sorts of different stories over the years of, uh, you know, animals just not even knowing when, when they realize that, oh, it's a human, oh my goodness, you know, I, right here, and they just, you know, run in circles, hmm. run into a tree, run into the person, knock the person over. Uh, yeah, so it's, um, it's definitely something that takes a, a lot of dedication and practice. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's something I encourage my students to constantly do because, uh, you know, even if it's just simple animals like squirrels or, or, or birds, uh, it really helps you to hone your stalking and movement skills. No two scenarios are ever going to be the same. Uh, you know, I, another thing I tell my classes is that, you know, stalking an animal is, is like a chess game. Um, you have to be thinking many moves ahead you have to be taking in the landscape around you. You have to pay attention to the direction of the wind, you know, where the sun is, what obstacles are there me, between me and the animal, which direction is the animal moving, uh, you know, what is the animal doing, is it feeding, is it just moving from point A to point B. Uh, and you have to really take all of that information into account. Um, and it's really on the fly, too. Mm, so yeah. it's uh, it's a... Uh, it's it's a it's a it's a really dynamic, uh, powerful experience yeah. uh, that I highly recommend. Even if it's just the squirrel you see in your yard every day, you know, try to try to sneak up on it, and see how it goes. <laughs> yeah, I guess you got to go through the stages. It require a lot of thinking at first, but like the four stages you probably heard about: unconscious incompetence, conscious in co mm. incompetence, conscious competence. And then conscious or, yeah, like unconscious competence. And so people know really quickly. First, someone doesn't know what the hell. They don't even know. They think they know everything, but they don't. And then someone goes, whoa, snap. I don't know this. I can't do this. And then someone's thinking about, okay, um, I'm getting good at it and learning, but I got to evolve a lot of thought. And then you get to the mastery stage where it's become second nature. And so you're really good at doing something without even thinking about it because it's the part of the way you, you normally experience yep. the world and do things. 
Or as like mm. Bruce Lee said, at first yeah, the that... punch was a punch. And then there's all these different punches and all this stuff to learn. And then later on, again, a punch is just a punch. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, that, and that's, you know, another thing, especially with the, with the stalking and movement, you, you have to practice it to where, you know, you just do it without thinking about it. Cause you know, what's that, how's that old statement go where there's thought, there's hesitation, where there's hesitation, there's failure. <laughs> um, and that's another, like, it's another really beautiful thing that I love about stalking and movement, you know, and I present it to my students you know, always in the form of think of it as a moving meditation. Yeah. Uh, and when you can achieve that stillness within yourself, when you're moving effortlessly a, a, across the landscape, um, you know, essentially as a shadow, you know, something really magical happens. I mean, it, it, sure. it, 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 it changes, it literally changes your brainwave patterns. It's, uh, it's really quite amazing. I mean, I've experienced it's, that. I mean, uh, I've been out in the woods for such a long time. It's like, yeah. I don't need meditation because I do it when I'm out in the woods like that. <laughs> when you're moving through the woods and going really slow. Like sometimes I've been out and I just do a kind of stalking thing through the woods, step over, step under, all this stuff. You, you know, you can go really slow and take like half an hour to go 70 or 100 yards. And that's even like pushing it a little bit. Yeah. I could go even slower, but... I only have so much time and I want to like make a little progress. So I could go a lot slower, but half an hour to go a hundred yards, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, and then if you, you want to slow it down even further, uh, you know, if I, if I tell people, mm -hmm. if you want to, to, to actually stalk and move and touch a deer, you're moving an average, you know, about a minute per step, hmm. you well, know, for yeah. that last few closing feet, uh, you know, and sometimes it may even be slower. Sometimes, you know, I've had, I've been out in, you know, hunting situations or just out in the woods and had a deer realize I was there and just sit there and, and stare at the spot where it thinks I am huh. for, you know, 40 or 45 minutes without, you know, blinking an, e blinking an eye or batting an ear. Just it knows something's there. And it's not going to give up until it realizes, <laughs> until it figures it out. Is uh, it? It's really, really, really quite amazing. Is it snorting during that time or no snorting at all? Oh yeah. Yeah. They'll, sometimes they will, but sometimes they'll, they'll just, you know, stand dead still, you know, cause mm -hmm. once again, animals know, or most animals know that, you know, most humans are pretty unaware and if they just <laughs> freeze in place and I can't tell you how many times I've, I've observed animals, you know, hear humans coming and they'll just, They'll just stop and freeze and, and know that most people are just staring at the ground in front of them as they walk, <laughs> yeah. not looking left, not looking right. And, you know, you'll just walk right by a deer or walk right by a fox. And, you know, they, they, animals are, animals are smart, smarter than we give them credit for. They oh, know yeah, how to exploit our awareness, sure, yeah. or our lack of awareness, I should say. And some of them have a good camouflage. I think it was on, I forgot which Facebook group, maybe um, seeing the animal, um, but someone had pictures there of, sorry, I forgot your name. Um, I looked at this really quickly, this post, but someone showed a wild boar they had gone by. It was lying there sleeping, and he had walked by it a few times. Then he finally saw it, and I think even he thinks that the boar learned about him at about the same time and then took off. But it was so well camouflaged in the, shru in the, in the shrubbery. He, he walked within yards of it and didn't even know it was there. Yep. But, uh, that, that will definitely, that will most definitely happen. <laughs> yeah. So some things that people can do to get better at movement. Um, for one thing, learn the geology, think about energy flow, but, uh, would you recommend, um, Chris McDougall's book? Um, do you remember what the, the name of that one was? Book. Pardon? Yeah, I think it's Born Born to Run. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's called. Was, I listened to that, too, maybe once yeah. or twice. That's a good book. I recommend that to people. Yeah. Um, did yeah, you... That's a good book. As I said, you know, the, 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 the biggest tip I can give people, um, uh, a few tips I'll give. Uh, the first one is to slow down. You mm -hmm. know, I, I would say on average, if you wanted to blend in better to the wilderness, 
move about as half a half the speed you would normally move you know from your car into your work in the morning if you're a if you're a fast person then then slow that down even move uh, even slower move a quarter of the speed you normally would uh you know th- th- another thing we modern humans tend to do especially when we're moving quickly is we take these really giant strides and we hit with these really heavy heel to toe footfalls uh which are really really loud you know if you animals like deer and, and foxes and you know that the, the, their sense of hearing is many times greater than ours so that like uh you know clip clopping that we make when we hit with those heavy heel to toe footfalls they're hearing that you know a ways off you know i always one uh, thing i tell my students is uh you know think of the first jurassic park movie with the t-rex and the the cup of water in the vehicle as the t-rex is making its heavy steps and there's the concentric rings and the cup of water so if you if you if you shorten your stride up and you don't hit with your heel first all of a sudden you'll you'll get rid of that that those heavy heel to toe footfalls you know i i challenge anybody listen to this after you're done listening go out and walk around the way you normally do with your fingers in your ears and you'll hear this like drum beat you know this kettle drum sound of your feet hitting the ground and that's because we take these long strides, we come down on an outstretched leg, on a locked out knee, and all of that shock is just going from the ground right up through our whole bodies, and it's rattling everything, you know, our ankles, our shins, our knees, our internal organs, and it, it's horrible for us. And it's sending people, you know, to, many of us move. sending people to the doctor. It's like the doctor, exactly. back doctor, foot doctor, yeah. Yeah, you know, many of us act like we don't have you know, built in shock absorbers called knees, Mm -hmm. you know, and I think a lot of people's poor movement also stems from where they keep their center of gravity. I think we modern humans tend to keep our center of gravity way higher up in our body than it should be. Yeah. You know, we should by by bending our knees a little bit when we're just standing or, or when we're walking, our center of gravity should be, you know, somewhere just under our belly button. Mm hmm. Whereas I think a lot of modern humans tend to keep their center of gravity in their chest, if not up in their head. When they do that, we're incredibly off balance. And it's good for horseback riding too. All sorts to compensate. Yep. Yeah, I've heard like people who are expert yeah, horsemen, sure. who are into natural horsemanship, talk about that. Like, um, who forgot his name right now, but he's into uh, black belt in Aikido, I think. And um, Mark Rashid, R A S H I D. He's got some good books, but. Uh, him and other people talk about how a lot of people they're thinking in their head but then when he gets mm-hmm. them to think focus on like your hips a little bit above that think about focus on that area then you can ride better or he'll do it with um, demonstrations with people standing up too i'm going to push against you think in your head okay now think from your mm-hmm. hip so to speak and they can tell it makes a difference so yeah, that's uh, um, agreed. It's like, yeah, yeah, for sure. It's a, it's a, it's a. You know, one of my favorite things to do is is people watch, and uh, if you spend enough time people watching, you can, you can, you can see a lot of these things that we would just normally wouldn't even pay attention to. You know, it's like when a modern human is at a standstill, and they want to initiate forward movement. What they tend to do is just, you know, they throw their head forward and in a blind panic, the rest of their body <laughs> is trying to catch up with their head, uh, you know, and it's it's this essentially this controlled fall, fall forward. And when we do that, we have no choice but to take these giant long strides. Uh, and because we're committing all of our weight to every step before we know what we're stepping on, our subconscious mind forces our eyes uh, to a 45 degree mm-hmm. angle to the ground in front of us to make sure there's nothing that's going to injure us. So, you know, I, I was, mm-hmm. I just ask yeah. people, you know, if you're moving, if you're moving too fast, if you're making a lot of noise and you're always staring at the ground in front of you, of course, you're not going to see any animals when you're out in the woods. Um, because you're just not, you know, they're, they're, they're going to hear you and hide and you're always looking at the ground in front of you. You know, most places you could go to a, a park and you could sit 10, 12 yards off a trail in a neon green shirt. <laughs> and most people walk, 
most people walking their dogs or running will just run right by you all day long and not even look at you because most people just always look at the ground in front of them. Yeah, one time I was out and I climbed up a tree and I wasn't even that tall, high up, 10 or 15 feet. And I don't remember how many people, but at least one person went right under me, didn't even know I was there, right above them. Yep. <laughs> oh, yeah, people very rarely ever look up. Yeah. You know, much less I decide, but very rarely ever look up. Yeah. But, uh, and folks can look up, um, t- to get more evidence that stepping flat footed or ball the foot is correct biomechanically, better for our bodies. You can look up Daniel Lieberman at the Harvard Barefoot uh, Running Lab. He's got videos, shows how the force how much force is like your, your knees and ankles have to deal with when you're hitting um, heel strike versus flat footed or ball. Yep. Um, mm-hmm. And we recommend you go slow. Don't try to do it out of nowhere. If you're used to wearing shoes, you got to work your way into minimalist stuff or barefoot. And you can look like, up what Katie Definitely. Bowman, the great biomechanist says, um, Danny Hammett, um, look up move nat stuff, M O V N A T. They got a lot of good stuff about breathing, and I like them a lot because, like tracking, if we look, we can learn a lot from the people who've done it a long time, like um, cultures that are still primitive. I think we should do the same thing with movement and tracking. Think about ourselves. Um, look at original human wisdom. That's one thing that MoveNet has done, like this Erwin LaCour guy, yep. and he's looked at, and he's actually in one of... Uh, um, Chris McDougall's books, Natural Born Heroes. He wrote that after Born to Run. Natural Born Heroes is a really good book, if I remember the name right. Um, and he talks about Erwan a lot in that book. Um, but it's a system of movement that studies, as I say, primitive cultures, modern science, um, teaches people how to walk, breathe, and they train um People just that are couch potatoes, but they also train like Navy SEALs and yeah. stuff like that. So that's like right in well, it's line. It's funny that you saying. actually mentioned. It's funny that you mentioned MoveNet. We are actually uh, collaborating on a class together. Sweet. Uh, Good in to the hear. Spring in wow. the spring out out here in Portland, Oregon, at one of our properties. Um, not quite sure of the dates yet, um, but it'll be it'll be sometime in the spring, probably May. Um, and it'll be up on, uh, it'll be up on their website, uh, wow. as well as our website, um, you know, which is trackersearth.com. So yeah, I was, I, I after my podcast with April, uh, Dan Clark, who is the, yeah, I know him. he's the COO. Yeah. Yeah. He, he's been he on some of my podcasts. Email and asked, Sweet. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. I noticed, uh, I noticed one a while back. Cool. Um, that I've been meaning to listen to. But, uh, yeah, he contacted me and asked if I'd be interested in, in, in collaborating on a class. And awesome. We were originally going to do it this fall, but things just didn't work out with my schedule. So now we've got it uh, hopefully be on the books for the spring. I'm really looking forward to working with those, working with them. And we're actually um, want to consult with them about building kind of a one of their cool obstacle <laughs> course uh, cool. You know, type things out at one of our properties out around here. Oh, that's awesome to hear. That's good. I'm glad uh, that's already been taken care of. I was thinking of trying to hook y'all up, but I'm glad it's already taken care of, and I'm going to have to. That's even better. Yeah. <laughs> Sweet. Yep. Already already done. And if Katie Bowman can get out there, too, that'd be good. But, um, but uh, yeah, I've got um, this year and last year, I got certified with them. Level one last year, level two this year. It's made a big difference in my movement. I'll, you know, I highly recommend anybody interested in tracking or the outdoors to get into their stuff, get certified if you want to, but at least look at the videos, a lot of free stuff, train accordingly. Um, yep. If you have access, you know, people spend a, people spend a ton of money on gym memberships. Uh, you know, you can, you can get just as good, if not better workout by carrying some rocks around and, and some logs and things like that. Yeah. It's one of the, one of the reasons why I'm thankful that, you know, a portion of my job is, is working with the land because I, it, it maintains some, 
a relative level of fitness within me, which is which is good. <laughs> yeah, and then as Danny's mentioned in a podcast, you get outdoors, maybe you learn to love running again because a lot of people use it as a punishment or you're going for time, but yeah, you get out in places like I use it. Sometimes I'll run fast, I'll sprint, but a lot of times I use running as primitive men did to get around. I want to go up and down the creek yeah. that I live on. Like, what is this area like? What is this area like? Do I need to clean up here? What's going on? I do it to explore. Run, stop for 10 yeah. minutes, run a little more, stop for half an hour, run back, whatever. But yeah, but do it efficiently and do it correctly. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's funny, you know, it's a, you know, it's our, if you look at, you know, peoples who still live, you know, primitively or semi-primitively, uh, you know, that have a, you know, that live off the land, so to speak, you know, they, they don't have a need for gyms or workout mm -hmm. routines. They're just, their lives and their, their diets, you know, our, our Western diet, I think we, we typically eat way more food than we actually need to. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, one of the, it's just, it's just amazing when you, uh, when you look at it that way and then you look at our, our Western culture and how much just sickness and cancer and all of that stuff. And it's just a combination of horrible food and inactivity and, you know, of course, pollution and things like that. And it's, uh, it's really, really quite sad. So, yeah. you know, it makes, makes me sad to think about. True. little fear of any hardship. It's like, I think it's, we've evolved and it's in our nature to yeah. need to do certain things that some people are scared of doing. Like, yeah. I went, changed my diet 10 years ago, do the paleo thing pretty much more or less, and it's helped me a lot. So um, the last three years in a row, I've done like a four-day fast. And mm -hmm. the first two times it was different, but this time um, I did kind of got myself into ketosis the first like two days before, um, cut out the carbs. Mm -hmm. I ate, but it was just meat, protein, and fat. So this was a lot easier, and I found it was interesting. This time, I was actually exercising 70 to 80 percent of normal. I'd actually do a few mile runs. There was two days where I actually had so much energy, I felt like I'd exercise twice a day, and I did. And people would think, mm -hmm. they think, oh, my gosh, if I don't eat for a day, I'm going to die. I can't do anything. I'm starving. Well, no, in our human mm -hmm. nature, it's not just me. I'm not special. It's because of the way we are as humans and yeah. how we've evolved. It's in every human being. We can do a lot more than we think, you know, four days. Oh, yeah. And I was still doing all this exercising. It's like we can do it. And it's, as you say, it's good no, for I, us because that will help prevent cancer and stuff. Yeah. Well, and I, you know, I tell the, the, the one of the main tenets of wilderness survival is something called the sacred order. And that's the order in which we need things typically to maintain our life force. You know, shelter is number one, because hmm. in many places we can die in as little as three hours without shelter. Uh, water is number two. We can go three days, you know, maybe four if you're lucky without water. Uh, fire is number three because, uh, you know, fire is an incredibly important tool for humans. Uh, but you know, food is number four and most people can go, you know, two, three weeks without eating before they're going to, you know, experience such debilitating effects that they're not going to be able to move around anymore. And, you know, anytime you rescue somebody who's been lost in the woods for a stretch of time, whether it's a day or a week and you ask them, you know, when you, when you realize that you were lost in the woods and you weren't, you weren't getting back to your campsite or getting back to your vehicle, what's the first thing you thought of it? 99% of people will say food. I thought about food <laughs> and that's, you know, you know, there's a funny story here. A guy, uh, up here in the mountains last year went, went missing for a week. He got his truck stuck up in the snow and in the newspaper article, it, you know, it says he survived off of, uh, uh, you know, melting snow and eating taco sauce packets. <laughs> I was like, no, that, that he found his drum. Like, no, he, he survived off the melting of the snow and the drinking of the water. He could have probably done without the taco sauce packets just Definitely. fine. Yeah. But I got to leave for work soon. Got to wrap up. Now, let me see. We were saying on the things people can do to move. Um, did we finish three things? So there's move slower. Oh, yeah. So slow him. Yeah. Move slower. Yep, slow down. So, yep. 
slow down, shorten your stride. Uh, that's the big one. So, you know, if you stand flat and you put your leg out in front of you and you were to fall forward, there's a, there's only a point so far where you put your leg out where if you were to fall forward, you have no choice but to hit on your heel. So you don't want to stick your leg out that far, that far. So I tell most people to shorten their stride length by half. Hmm. Um, so slow down, shorten your stride length. And the most important one, or one of the most important one, is that you feel what you are stepping on before you fully commit your weight to it. Yeah. Right? And the reason we do that is because, you know, our, our feet, the bottom of our feet have something like 200,000 nerve endings in them. And, and they're meant to act as earthward antenna that talk to the ground and relay information about what we're stepping on. And if you use your feet to talk to the ground and you're not going too fast and you're feeling what you're stepping on before you commit your weight, all of a sudden your eyes don't always need to be at a 45 degree angle to the ground in front of you. You can be looking around, you can be looking up, you can be looking left, you can be looking right. That's not going to, that doesn't mean that I don't occasionally glance at the trail in front of me to make sure there's like a giant hole or a, or a, or a, or a big rock or something like that. <clears throat> mm-hmm. But if I, if I, by slowing down and feeling what I'm stepping on before I commit my weight, all of a sudden that frees my eyes and my other senses, uh, to look around. And you'd be, you'll, you'll be amazed at how just those few things can, can completely change your experience, uh, in the wilderness. Or in general, you know, and another thing I tell people too, if you to start to cultivate that this sense of slowness, I actually just gave my my year long adult students this homework assignment yesterday when I finished out our weekend. I said every day I want you to take 10 minutes and do something that you would normally do in your house, but do it at a quarter of the speed. Mm, Whether that's putting Mm. your dip, put put putting your dishes away, folding your laundry. Uh, you know, any chore you might do, do it at, at a quarter of the speed that you would normally do it. Or, you know, give yourself 10 minutes to go from a sitting position to a full, fully standing position. Um, yeah, and, and a huge part of it is just trying to, you know, cultivate that, that slowness. Because the speed uh, is built into everything we do nowadays. We have faster and faster cars, faster and faster phones. Uh, everything's fast, 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 go, 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 go. And it's just, it's not, uh, it's not a healthy way to live. You know, it's not, doesn't do anybody any good. Yeah. And I think if we think about that a little more implicit in what you're saying there is when we move slower, then we have time to be more mindful. We're more aware of things. If we're out tracking or in the woods looking for stuff, if we're moving too fast, we're going to miss it. Like I like to tell people when I'm tutoring and stuff, get them to think, make connections from different areas. So people think about, okay, if you're in a forest and you sprint on a trail, how much are you going to see? How much do you know? How much do you know the environment and ecology versus do the same trail, but walk now, see what you can observe and then walk and stop, look around, walk and stop, look around. When we move slower, then we have time to process, learn, Mm -hmm. Whereas we don't, when we're trying to do the fire hydrant thing, is like a lot of schools do, unfortunately. They go too fast, too. Run, 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 run. Can we just stop and process? Exactly. I know if I want to... And eventually you get... Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Okay. I was going to say, eventually you you get to a point where uh, you can start to process things at faster speeds if you do have to run through the woods. Yeah, um, but true. you're not going to get there without first cultivating the slow, you know, it's cultivating like, the slowness and really paying attention to your surroundings. Those four steps again, going from unconscious incompetence to unconscious competence. Yeah, yeah. I know. If I wouldn't have gone slow, a lot of times I'd miss a lot of things out, out in the um, in the woods, turtles, snakes, certain tracks, plants, all mm-hmm. kinds of things. Um, I just totally miss them, but exactly. So I like to tell my, I like to tell my folks to, you know, find the grandeur in the small things that most people walk by every day. Yeah. You know, even on a city sidewalk, you can find beautiful little patches of nature that people just walk by and never notice. And you can, it can happen anywhere. 
you know, there's little magic wonders around us. And, you know, if they're small, especially people just completely ignore them. Yeah, true. And we've got to learn to appreciate it. Like Darwin's last book was about earthworms. Mm. He, he read a whole massive tome. <laughs> he did a lot of research on the, the lowly worm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But cool. So I wish we could talk more. i got to run off to work. But um, hope that help yeah. people. Um, Who said it? Pardon? Go ahead. Oh, no. I was going to say, yeah, if you if you wanted to schedule another time to, to to Great. finish it out, I'd be more Heck than yeah. open to that as well. Good. But, we yeah. can You could schedule that via email. So Good. I think it's an important thing. Um, people need to learn how to move better so they can track better, see more animals. Seems like, in my ignorance, I'm just a newbie, but it seems like something that trackers need to work on more in general. Um, what's your experience? Is that, do you think that's right or am I wrong or? Oh, no, 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 for sure. Okay, uh, cool. it, it, it is important. The, the, the movement part is, uh, is a, is a keystone to, to everything. Uh, you know, if you can't cultivate that slowness, you're going to miss a lot. And if you're a tracker and you're trying to pick out, you know, finite details, um, you know, you're, you're going to miss it unless you can, you know, really look at it from that place of the, of the slow mind. And by slow <laughs> mind, I don't mean that in a, in a bad way in any way. It's just, you know, we oh, have yeah. to learn to, yeah. it's all about our brainwave patterns, you know. And then you <clears> think that's something that the tracker community in general needs to work on better movement quality. For sure. Yeah. yeah. Cause just For cause sure. a lot of it's not our fault. I, 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 Go ahead. Oh no, it's not our fault. It, like I said, it's our it's our it's our modern society. But yeah. I've mm-hmm. I've I've uh, you know there there's a local park I fish at pretty regularly, and through the local park system, they run a you know a tracking program. You know, they're like half day things, and you know, last year I watched this group of volunteers come down to the beach and this river to lay out track to like put uh, flag markers and cert tracks, and they were just bumbling around. <laughs> Yeah, you know, stepping on mountain lion tracks, looking wow. for deer tracks, and I'm like, "There's some mountain lion tracks there that <laughs> you know people are interested in seeing. There's deer tracks all over this beach, but there's only one set of mountain lion tracks. Or what about those skunk tracks that you just wow. walked right by? Wow, um, you know, and it's you know, it's also not being focus locked on any one thing. You know, it's 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 being able to take as take as much data in as possible on your uh, uh, on your surroundings. Yeah, There's right. never just one animal moving through an area, you know, yeah, animals have true. highways just like we do and they all cool. share them. And then some of the problems with movement we have nowadays is to say it's not our fault. It's like um, ideas in the culture, um, the furniture we use, we think it's great, it's comfortable. But when we dig into it, like Katie Bowman and some others have done, we see the bad effects it does have on us. I mean, I wouldn't have thought I never see the hell figured it out on my own, but reading what some of them say, thinking about it. Um, I see that, yeah, like some car seats, things like conveniences in the home and in buildings really negatively affect our movement quality. Um, and we mm-hmm. need to be thinking about that and still use some of the conveniences, but try to um, use them appropriately and work on our, our animal self and our movement quality to take better care of ourselves yep. and be healthier and then be able to move in the environment better. So, yeah, it's kind of like, that's like I said, in April's pot. Oh, go, ahead. go ahead. What? Yeah. Go ahead, sorry. Well, it's kind of like forced on us because of constraints on the culture that we don't like me, like normally think about. So if we like break out of that, I think it'd help the tracking community a whole lot, make us more effective trackers, more healthy, get us more in tune with the environment, you know, doing the thing, the three things you said, looking up move nat yep. looking up katie bowman but so yep. what are you saying and about the, april's the last piece of advice uh, i was just going to say the the, the the last piece of advice i'll give people is is one of the things i really love about tracking is you can always be tracking you don't <laughs> have to be in a pristine wilderness setting um you know i track all the time when i'm in the city and you know you know, whether that's, you know, in small flower beds or, hmm. you know, looking at people's vehicles and trying to decide what they do for a living based on the condition of the inside of their vehicle or, 
you know, how many people may drive that car by the, uh, you know, the fingerprints and the dust on the rear view mirror, uh, you know, and, and once again, it all ties back into awareness as well. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm fascinated by these things about, you know, why when somebody puts something down, why would they put their water bottle on their left side versus their right <laughs> side? Or huh, why, why, why do they, yeah. why do they choose to sit in this spot versus that spot? And, so we can always be tracking, we can always be honing that skill, um, you know, and honing that awareness, no matter where we are, we, we, we shouldn't get locked into the idea that we can only practice these two art forms, you know, the tracking and awareness when mm. we're in the wilderness, True. because they can be, they can be done, you know, no matter where you are. Yeah. And that can help protect you from criminal activity. Exactly. <laughs> so that's that as well. That's a whole subject in itself, but I better run for work as it is now. I'm probably going to be late, but so any last words, Tom? Um, no, just like I said, slow down, enjoy the woods. Don't rush. Take it all in. Um, there, there's, there's magic happening out there all the time. And if we, uh, if we can tap into that, it'll make us that, that much better human beings and True. take us out of that rat race for a little while. Cool. Good advice. So thanks. Hope you enjoyed that, folks. Cool. Hope it was helpful and hope to have more good conversations with Tom in the future. So Excellent. I look forward to it. Okay. Thank you, sir. Have a good day. Appreciate it. You too. Bye.